I knew that I had the concept. I wanted to work on something that had to do with free will and the limits to the freedom of our will. You see half images and half lights. For example, you could look inside of the boxes and you could see this yourself in cracked mirrors. That this can flow into my system, my body, and if it can go beyond me and help others, then I would say absolutely. That was the voice of award-winning Canadian visual artist Isaac Hall. This is CITR Radio, and a special for the Arts Report program. For the next half hour, you'll be hearing Isaac talk about her life story and the inspirations and philosophical underpinnings of her art. If you are listening live on CITR Radio, you can follow for a visual reference at facebook.com slash artsreport. And you can also see some pictures at the official Isaac Hall website, that's e i s e r t dash h a w l dot com. So we are here on CITR Radio, and I'm very pleased to be sitting with award-winning Canadian visual artist Isaac Hall. Uh, Isaac, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Matt. I've made the trip all the way here to your home in Suintula, which is a small community on the very far north of Vancouver Island, BC, Canada. A uh, wonderful place um, because I really wanted to see where you're continuing your work day to day as an artist. Isaac, you started out your career in the arts, at least your education, doing fine arts degree in Alberta. In Alberta, yes, yes, I did the、um, fine arts degree in、uh, University of Alberta. And from there, I went to the Ontario College of Art and、uh, picked up a couple years, and and then、um, uh, returned to Alberta. I was married at the time, and so、uh, Ronald got a job in Lethbridge, and so there I, I I could not go to university again. I had to have one more swipe at it. Yeah, <laughs> I tend to love those、uh, places of learning. They're very dear to me. And、uh, wherever I was, I I did art. There's no doubt about it. My neighbors in Lethbridge, absolutely. Well, you know, you do art, and that's what you're happiest at. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with awards along the way too, and also some joints overseas. In, in reference to my art, I went to Rome and Florence in 1984, and over there, I, of course, went into as many cathedrals as I possibly could, and the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, where I had I had gone over there specifically to study medieval art, one aspect of that of medieval art, and that's where I encountered triptych type art form. And according to the perceptions and my experience in Europe, I came back to Lethbridge, Alberta, to do another unusual thing besides what I had done in the late seventies, called environments within and without、hmm. communication centers,、uh, and that's 1977-78. For the first time in my art making, I really needed to move right into real space of the gallery, and of course I. Was somewhat appraised of the fact that installation work was being done. I'd lived in New York, sixty-nine, seventy. Can remember walking into a Donald Judd exhibition in Uptown New York with my little girl with me. So all of these red and yellow boxes, believe it or not, Judd. Well, he did boxes. Either they were climbing up walls, and he was a minimalist, as I understand. Those kind of rarefied, no touch, very slick, not. One sense of any human. I remember my little daughter、uh, began to walk close to one, and he said, "Oh no, 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 the guard, no, you know." So when I got back to that bridge, I put some legs on the boxes. I put unseen legs. Well, I had, I made boxes for one thing, and that was the inspiration that I received in New York, as well as Rosenberg and a number of others, even Frank Stella, the whole bunch. With some trepidation, in a way, into making an art form to begin with, that I, I had never seen anything like that I had imagined in my mind in Lethbridge, Southern Alberta. I dared to do try something that was out of、uh, whack. 
So that's that's where that one uh, found legs on uh, Donald Judd's kind of slick boxes. I knew that I had the concept. I wanted to work on something that had to do with free will and the limits to the freedom of our will. And so that brought me face to face with culture. Mm. It brought me face to face with the community I lived in. It brought me to face to face with my country called Canada. And beyond that is the international scene. And I knew that there were ins- installations out there, that kind of thing. So I certainly was not the first at that. There was mm. Judy Chicago in the United States. There was Joyce Whelan working in Canada doing certain stuff with her um, controversial and criti- social political work. And I've always been a social political person, but not in my art. Those were the first forays that I took into the social political realm in okay. in very conservative southern Alberta. So uh, would you say that you are a, a conceptual artist? Uh, heavens no. Oh gosh no. <laughs> conceptual artist, how could I own that? I would say that uh, I'm not a pure conceptual artist. I see in my work a certain amount of modernist trends and yet my thinking is not modernist. I am not a purist, and I would certainly have nothing to do with Greenberg. I've got to have some legs and arms and feet and a head, and I've got to have some. I've got to have some sense of of everything that goes what it is to be human, I guess. Uh, and and I think it was worse in the '70s, coming out of that. Maybe it was more modernist that we're thinkers, we solve things with thinkers, and if I'm not too sure, there might have been Rene Descartes in there somewhere. And uh, certainly without knowing who the hell what is, I am very definitely in a position within my being to fight oppositions. I do not like oppositions, and my art tends to build, therefore, on how I would like to see what more of I would like to see in society. Okay, so it's focusing on dualities is something you try to steer away from. Oh, no, I go oh. right... Something that I want to face, I, I hit it right in the, in the middle. And so, in a sense, you're right, but in a sense, not. I take on dualities to collapse them. I, I try to collapse them with the materials that I'm working, the techniques that I'm using, I will dissolve dualities in any way that I possibly can. One of those ways, environments, within and without, 1977-78. And so I made the box puppet literally into quasi kind of human. Now it's suddenly got legs hanging down inside of the box, and it's got legs that go from the box to the floor because I just found uh, old abandoned chairs and set the box on at least a couple chairs and one box on a ladder. And so I was opening up a range of dialogue. That's one thing I Mm. like to do with my work. I get into dialogue and it's dialogue between the parts. And so in this one, I, I I took on the complex situation of trying to work out a theme on free will and determinism. I mean, what do I think I am, a philosopher? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, I married a philosopher. (laughs) I was with a philosopher for 18 years, so you got to learn something. And uh, I sit and the ideas just come to me. They come into my head. And so once I had the free will determinism concept, And uh, then I had to put legs on that because it's a human story. I don't think it's a human construct, but I think a lot of the things that we do in our culture and society is a human construct. And I take those kinds of things on with the way technique of working and the kinds of materials that I work and how I put materials with materials. So what I did is I juxtaposed. I'm not sure I like that word. I linked I think I like linked better, like to bring things together, negative and positive, human dramas within the boxes, so it had a strong audio component to it. In fact, it was simultaneous uh, sound 
of human voices working out the dramas in negative, positive. I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now!, Daily Grassroots Global Unembedded International Independent News Hour. And this is CITR 101.9 FM. Welcome back to CITR Radio and the Arts Report special on Canadian visual artist Isaac Hall. You can follow if you're listening live on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash artsreport, where you can find a visual reference. And Isaac's website is E-I-S-E-R-T dash H-A-L-L dot com. Let's get into the next part of this interview. And I'm very aware of, in terms of environment and the socio-political research you've done, Marshall McLuhan has been a big influence. And there's a little quote I've got here from your website. Environments are not passive wrappings, but active processes which work us over completely. That's from Marshall McLuhan. I love Marshall McLuhan. I read him. I read his book. And... uh, The medium is the message, is what he called it. It set the imagination on an incredible journey. And and yes, that became a social, political statement within that. And it certainly, with the simultaneous uh, sound, the audio, blasting through the gallery space, it was just like you'd walk up the stair and there there it would be just this enormous sound coming out. And I loved that. I thought that was really, really wonderful. And uh, it, it, I would say, yes, it did in rap, and I had built-in uh, subliminal, subliminal kinds of stimuli that would prompt people to... I, I, th- I felt that it would prompt them like the advertising design does, and it, it stimulates something in... You see half images and half lights. For example, you could look inside of the boxes and you could see this yourself in cracked mirrors. Yes, the mirror was the way that I absorbed the people, gave the people heads, and gave them heads from different angles. The mirrors were inside of the boxes. I was into process at that time. Like, everything just opened up to me, the whole uh, uh, experience of being an artist, learning how to, you know, prepare the canvas or the wood, or masonite I was going to work on, ground it, and then paint it. All of those processes were revealed for the people who would be aware of that, aware that I was working as that process in art. That process actually was a metaphor. I had metaphors within metaphors within and extended, I'm sure. We've got boxes with heads on them, The feet aren't sticking out the bottom, but obviously they're sitting on chairs, some of them. And then there was the manipulator overhead, okay. Then it's it's a ceiling to floor installation. And a whole bunch of those, hey, we got to look at those over here pretty soon. Given your very strong ideas about what you were doing then, were you aware of being part of any modern movement in Alberta at the time? I wasn't overly self-conscious of it because it was like, this is what I have to do. And that is verified by projects that I've done later. It's like once an idea is set in my mind, uh, I am furiously devoted to it, very furiously devoted, and I, I cannot be shaken. I was aware that installation work was being done. Uh, it was basically... In Canada, there was some reference to collaging and that kind of thing. And so what I was doing is collaging only in, more in a, a sculpted in three-dimensional sense. Uh, but in the United States, there was people like Judy Chicago. There were a lot of people. There was a person who crawled under a step and did various things with his private parts. And, you know, these there were lots of um, things that I was aware of. But somehow, what, even though my local area, I cannot, I cannot conform because I see it doing, it being done around me. In fact, I might even go in the other direction because, uh, well, I think that it's genuine because the pressure in me to understand something means that I have to go beyond myself and go beyond the community around me in order 
to realize that something that I need to realize. And the first ground of that knowing comes between myself and my artwork. And as I was saying, anything else get between me and that, and, and that, that's not good. So yes, I was, but no, I follow my, I would say bliss, but I also follow my misery in having to be shaken from the nice little things that are all around me that other people seem to enjoy. But that doesn't bother me because my understanding of something, the need for that is far greater than any other conforming need there could possibly be for me to distort myself. In fact, that is increasingly what my materials, my techniques, my way of working, my way of allowing an openness so that that this can flow into my system, my body, and if it can go beyond me and help others, then I would say, absolutely, I have not lived my life in vain. That's right. I mean, and you, you couldn't have done works about environment within and without without being aware of the social context around you. So it seems like over the years you have achieved some semblance of balance between refusing to be drawn any particular direction because of a movement or popularity f to focus on your unique goal and yet still be able to be aware of the social context and comment on it the hair standing up in my head and I say yes yes I do I follow I follow what is truth for me and my inside self and that's part of what environments within and without address mm. itself to and I've seen philosophers address that element like Charles Taylor our Canadian philosopher long after I had the quest to develop that within myself I have one regret. The community that I lived in at that time, the women sought me to speak to them about my work, and I was so shy, I could not do it. Even though I could go and perform amidst my artwork and on the local television programs, my shyness kept me away from a small group of women, and for that I have had regrets. Hello, Vancouver. This is Carolyn Mark. You're listening to CITR 101.9 on your FM dial. Uh, Isaac, what can you tell us about this? Again, this is uh, very much a socio-political type of uh, exhibition. I'm talking about human beings, power and culture, and how it's delegated, and what uh, would seem to be some of the uh, consequences of that. Okay, so it is an installation. It, it had three large paintings. Now, in this, I realized that, okay, I'd done environments, and that was fully participant-centered with people walking right amidst these humanoid box puppets. In this one, I have stills on the walls. They're just three large paintings. Uh, one was the prisoner story, these uh, were meant to be nailed with rough nails to the wall of the gallery, and I did have uh, part of that uh, installation shown in Montreal, believe it or not, at the peace conference. <laughs> and so the, the in intention of this whole uh, way, art form that I used, was again to personalize. Like generally when we see flat things against the wall, except we generally don't see them ma nailed, we see them in frames. Well, I, I had a war on frames ever since the 70s. So the, the, it's, it means that it's open to the environment. It's, it's the space that we walk in. Each painting had a text. The Powers text had the literal uh, story uh, written to a social psychologist, and that would have been Zim, uh, Zimbardo, Philip Zimbardo. So we have the posting by the prisoner story, the prisoner story by Choice C. C. Here, do nothing. The heads in boxes, 
I have uh, the posting of the Stanford University experiment. This is the medium of the artist, and also the medium of the artist is the reflected image of the person looking in the mirror as they read this with their view to the paintings on either side. Mm. And then in the last painting I had and powers, which referred to another more benevolent power and in this case it was the image of higher power and each culture has their own higher power but I chose the higher power of the Western world which is the the Christian the Christ image just going back to the Stanford prison experiment for people unfamiliar this was the famous experiment where they had 24 intelligent middle-class college students who were in a mock prison and uh, seeing how human values became suspended for a time where people became kind of oppressive guards. That's but right. also you, you, you talk about how some of the good guards were kind of complicit by really not doing anything. So, so can you speak to that, how maybe us viewing your art piece here are meant to reflect on our own, maybe our weaknesses around that, around being complicit? In, in the case of the Stanford University experiment, uh, there were people in there really being brutal to the so-called inmates, and the inmates cowering on, you know, begging and, and no leniency. And so what was happening is that they were just facilitating the, the status quo or the oppression of that uh, context that, that had happened as a result of the people be, being there in, in a so-called prison experiment and, uh, and uh, the pressures of that experiment bearing upon them. Well, there's prisons and there are prisons. And I use the prison as a metaphor to speak to us about other kinds of prisons. And I'm not declaring what they are, but, you know, you pretty much said it. And and at the time, externally, what was happening politically in the world, 1984, I guess that was around the nuclear arms race uh, and things like that. Was there anything in the news that you were tuned into that influenced your choice of, of power as the subject for this piece? Well, I've been a child of this generation, and I was born at a time when a dictator was rampaging through Europe. And uh, I can still remember the audio that came out of the radio at that time. I was a preschooler, very young, and I think it's, it's like what that we are surrounded by, we're massaged by, it's technology, technologies now in this late modern, but in those days it was the sound coming out of audio, out of radios, and one could hear those sounds and, and um, they, they are they are speaking to the nervous system and setting one up for angst that even perhaps comes years after the uh, intake of that particular stimuli, the perception of a kid, can you imagine? And, and uh, we were just between a terrible Cold War, I can remember Kennedy uh, and the standoff over Cuba. I was in Sudbury at the time, and uh, Ronald was there. And, and I can remember the angst that was around that. And one didn't know all of the inner politics. We find out about that, you know, 50 years later. Well, not quite that much. Yes, I was affected, always been affected by international. Can't help. That is my community just as much as the community that I stand in. I, I'm here, I'm here, and I'm doing what I'm called to do. That's the way that is. Just focusing on one of the specific pieces here in the 1984 Powers exhibition, which looks to me like a, a prison uh, set up with some guards and some figures in black. Can you uh, speak? Yeah, the, when I um, translated a real prisoner's sense of the interior of the prison, and some of those uh, surely must not have been so great. The food is bad. If you uh, get complain about the food, you're going to be chastised or you're going to have sanctions come down upon you. Well, isn't you know, that happens to us everywhere, doesn't it? And, and so there were those pressures upon the prisoner, and he was writing to the sociologist to inform the sociologist as to what it was like. So he was a faceless nobody in there. Okay, that's speaking to the prison experience. What about the people out here? 
What about the people who have been denied? What about the people that, that have no power? What about the people that have no freedoms or limitation upon their freedoms? So in a sense, I can see environments kind of filtering through into the powers, the voice of powers, 1984. And there is a, a level of that coming through. And as I work through these projects through the years, I realize that, my goodness, I got another line or another level coming alive later on down the way. It's like it's uh, some of it just happened automatically so that I was not really aware of what was happening. And I discover afterwards that, oh, my goodness, look at this level of communication. But then I do introduce the and powers, which gives an indication that we're not, are we, it asks the question, uh, my work asks questions, and that's the way I start. I start with the question, and then the question unrolls. As I begin to work with the uh, materials, the art materials, whether it's wood, in that case it was canvas and paper and mirrors and and uh, I, as it unrolls, I begin to uh, see a little bit more what I need to understand. So those people in black were, black for me is not necessarily evil. Uh, it used to be an ancient time positive as a matter of fact. And I was aware of that when I was doing this project as well. It, these people are um, people of any standing anywhere who are faceless the no-name objects that walk around on legs. Yes, I have quite a war, a war with subject and object relationship, and I battled with that all the way from René Descartes on down to Charles Taylor, who does, would never speak that way. Canadian philosopher, at least he's contemporary, wasn't on the edge of the industrial, we're in, on the edge of another kind of industrial re revolution. I get the sense you, you, you seem to be referring to the dominant philosophies of the time uh, keeping us all in jail. Unfortunately, I've had to see how the brilliant men of the time have kept us in jail and uh, at the same time kept others in jail without voices until whatever time the voiceless Frere comes to my mind, the pedagogy of the oppressed until we get voices and begin to fight back and stand up, we're kept. You, you got it. Historical. Very good. Very good man. I hope you enjoyed that half-hour special devoted to the life and works of Canadian visual artist Isaac Hall. You can find Isaac online at www.eisert-hall.com. This has been a special for the Arts Report program on CITR 101.9 FM in Vancouver, BC, Canada. My name is Matt. You can find more interviews that I've recorded at ozstrandedradio.com. That's ozstrandedradio.com. Thanks very much for tuning in. Bye for now. Australia and Canada are both countries with a whole lot of space to create some of the wildest sounds on the planet. Join your host Matthew as he explores the musical heritage of his native Australia and features fresh sounds from Canada's independent music world. That's Stranded, the Australian-Canadian music show, live Fridays from 6 to 7.30 p.m. on CITR 101.9 FM. And I'm stranded on my own.